Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Vice President of International Marketing at Hortonworks, John Kreisa. All right. Good morning and welcome to day three for DataWorks Summit. Very good to be with you this morning and have all of you back today. So today, day three, is going to be all about community and ecosystem. So we're going to have some demonstrations uh, of uh, the latest versions of Hadoop. We're going to hear from some more enterprise customers who are using the technology. And we'll also hear from some of the other ecosystem players on how that technology can help you um, grow and use your deployments. So pretty excited about that. What I want to start with today is another poll. So the poll should be pushed live into your app. For those of you, I'm going to try it again. Glutton for punishment. We're going to try it again. Actually, it worked yesterday afternoon, so that's good. Or yes, at the end of the day yesterday. So the poll that we want to ask you, since we're going to talk more about Hadoop, we're going to see what's coming in the latest version of Hadoop, is where are you with your Hadoop journey? So look for that in the um, activity stream of the DataWorks Summit app. So Wi-Fi, don't let me down. Uh, and I want to see how long have you been using Hadoop? So you've got a couple choices here. Less than a year, maybe haven't even started with it. One to three years, you're starting to get really your groove. Um, three to five years, you're really uh, using it in production, probably have multiple applications running, de developing business value. Or you're really, really good with it. You've been using it for a long time, and you've used it for more than five years. So pick one of those that makes most sense for you. And I'll give you just a second to go ahead and give an answer. It's not working. No internet. I'm damned. Maybe I should just do you know, what I learned from yesterday and that they did make fun. Let's do hands. How about that? OK. Less than a year. OK. Good. One to three. Ooh, a lot of people in the one to three. That's good. Three to five. Still pretty good number. Now, let's see how many veterans there are out there. Five years or more. OK, a small, smaller group. OK, when the internet comes back, <laughs> I will ask you to take the time to go ahead and answer the question. So we did get a few votes. Some of you did get your votes in. That's good to see, actually. Let's see if that fits. Actually, that matches with what I saw from the terms of hand standpoint. A lot of people in the one to three. So that's good. It is working. Do continue to put your votes in there. But it gives us a sense of where everybody is, where this audience is in terms of your experience with Hadoop, and it actually helps our presenters as they come up understand what they're dealing with. So let me go ahead and take that down. I want to bring up our first presenter. And as I did yesterday, um, we asked all of the presenters uh, a little bit about themselves, what their first data job was, as well as um, a fun fact for them. Uh, this next speaker that we're going to have up here today, his first job was doing analysis of cell phone customer data for, a, for McCaw Cellular, small cellular. I haven't heard of them, but McCaw Cellular. And fun fact um, is that he competed at the World Debating Championship when he was at MIT. So don't get in an argument with this guy. <laughs> Let me bring up Ron Bodkin from Teradata. Ron? There you go. Good luck. Thanks, John. Well, good morning. It's great to be here at the DataWorks Summit. Um, I, as, you, as many of you know, uh, my background in the Hadoop space, I actually started working with Hadoop a little over 10 years ago when I was at Quantcast as the VP of Engineering. Went on to start uh, Think Big Analytics as the founding CEO, and uh, we were acquired into Teradata about three years ago. And I'm excited to talk to you today about the opportunity, the value that we see coming out of our customers' investments in Hadoop and Teradata, the opportunity to really move forward into the world of artificial intelligence. So as many of you know, the artificial intelligence is very much in the mindset and in the, tr the press because so much is happening, right? The digitization of data, the mass amounts of data that we can now store in Hadoop and Teradata has really opened up amazing opportunities, right? Combine that with the exponential improvements in hardware, notably graphic processing units, uh, that continue to improve at an unbelievable rate. Just in the last few weeks, announcements from both NVIDIA and Google, how they're optimizing chips to drive deep learning performance at a faster rate than Moore's Law's advances, um, you know, which has resulted in things like superhuman computer vision and language translation applications. 
you know, and which has led to a surge of interest and in, in, in innovation and research in academia, in large corporations and startups, right? So all of this is coming together as a positive feedback loop to mean AI has, re, has really enjoyed a resurgence. I actually was very interested in AI back when I was studying at MIT in the early 90s, but clearly I was a few decades too early, but now we're really in an era where we're seeing significant progress happening. So with that in mind, you know, where are we seeing enterprises take advantage of this stuff, right? It's great that it's out there and, you know, we all enjoy seeing things like Echo Dots from Amazon or Facebook doing uh, recognition of faces, but we're seeing enterprises, our customers really adopt uh, these deep learning capabilities, whether it be going from rule-based systems to traditional, you know, simpler machine learning algorithms, adding deep learning is adding significant value. Right? And we're seeing this in cases like predictive maintenance, where we can look at rich time series of diverse data and better understand underlying trends and respond to figure out what needs to be fixed. I'll talk a little bit more about anti-fraud that we're seeing in banking and other places. Recommendation engines, whether it be using the power of deep learning to generalize its embeddings over the long tail, or using uh, time series again to look across a series of events to better make recommendations where we see leaders like Spotify and Google and Zalando all achieving stunning results with deep learning, uh, churn reduction and yield optimization. Let's talk a little bit more about deep learning and anti-fraud as a case that we're working with customers on, a number of our customers. And what we're seeing is, of course, digitization is driving an explosion of mobile payments, the digital payments. Um, fraudsters are in the game being more sophisticated and having a bigger impact, right? And many of the, the old handwritten rules approach using small amounts of data just isn't cutting it, right? There's too much cost, there's too much delay, too much customer impact. I was musing just looking in my wallet, both of my major credit cards, my work and my personal cards have been uh, canceled due to fraud in the last few months, so it's an increasing problem for all of us, right? So it's not an option to not keep up with the, the best technology. This is an example. This is a receiver operating curve showing the results we're getting with a customer of ours. Um, the little red dot is what we were achieving. They were achieving with a traditional rules engine. In just 12 weeks, using traditional machine learning, mostly um, a kind of decision tree model, uh, we got better results. But the really exciting thing for me are those bars at the top, which show even though this is a mid-sized regional bank and it's not a massive amount of data, we we're able to get a lot better results. So like half as much fraud, or for the same amount of fraud, five times fewer false positives. So it's a big advantage, right? That ability to use deep learning to understand the sequence of transactions and, and come up with a smarter model than just a decision tree based on here's what's happening now, right? So that's leveraging the power of data and deep learning, um, in this case, using GPUs with TensorFlow to achieve you know, meaningful results. So we see, think we're seeing that kind of result in combining deep learning with wide learning in a lot of domains. You know, and, and really, we do see a variety of options. One of the exciting things is you can go beyond traditional machine learning techniques to doing things like you could use, we, in fact, what's working best there is a kind of network that came out of the vision space, convolutional neural networks, or in this case, a residual network. Um, but there's also ways of having memory with recurrent neural networks. And, even new kinds of generative networks that, that have a kind of adversarial networks trained against each other. So we're trying out all of these with our customers and seeing in different cases, different ones work. This is a great example also of how the explosion research in deep learning is really enabling new techniques that can be used in a rapid pace and the importance of having a data science approach where you can test and learn and you know, have rapid iterations of results. So with that, you know, what we're seeing is also important is when you're using these more complicated models, it's not enough just to come up with a black box with an answer. It's really important to know why you're coming up with those results. So you can trust the models. So you can have investigators for fraud say, well, why do we think there's fraud here? Well, it looks like this customer group is suspicious or the amount of money being taken out is suspicious. And indeed, for Europeans and other countries where they have strict privacy laws, it may be required legally to be able to explain to a customer why you made a decision like thinking there was fraud. So we think having this kind of model explanation um, as part of what you're doing in deep learning is not an option, but you gotta do it. You know, with that, Architecturally, what we're seeing is 
these kinds of systems have to be integrated into existing flows, right? So, you know, in this case, a, a mainframe payment processing system where there's a message bridge, data gets enhanced in a NoSQL database, then a series of workers run, which those workers can run in different environments based on microservices that let you use the power of GPUs in micro batches to do deep learning models as well as CPUs for more traditional models that get aggregated within milliseconds to make a decision and allow you to respond and keep track of the data with the use of Hadoop as a key environment in this case for where the data is used to improve the models, to understand them, uh, you know, to keep innovating and coming up with better results, right? So that's, that's a kind of architecture. There's a lot of variation, a lot of different ways to do these models, to execute them. But you know, building these models where you can both train them at scale and then execute them in milliseconds is a common requirement we're seeing around the deep learning space. So what are the challenges we're seeing with customers in the implementing these use cases? Using GPUs is disruptive. They're not CPUs. They need different scheduling and different resource management. If you don't have your data foundation right, if you don't have data you can trust with governance, if you don't have your analytical system in place, you can't succeed using data science. And I talked about transparency. Can you understand your models? Can you trust them? Can you get the business to use them? You know, still a lot of the innovation in the deep learning space is research driven. A lot of great ideas are now available on open source repositories that our researchers created, but you may need to do a little bit of work to take that great idea and turn it into something you can actually use in production. In fact, you probably do. Um, many times we're seeing also that there's problems where the data isn't well labeled, right? These algorithms love massive amounts of data, but you need to understand, you know, what are the good and bad cases, right? What is this an example of? So if you have image data, you may have to get a bunch of people crowdsourced on uh, something like Mechanical Turk to go out and mark all the data to say, well, what are these examples of? And, and last of all, you know, the shift to AI, to being more automated in making process decisions, ultimately is about changing business processes in the enterprise, and that's a big change. Some of the low-hanging fruit, the examples I talked about earlier, are cases where you can plug in and make an improvement without re redoing a whole business process. But more broadly, that's a challenge. You know, and of course, this is new technology. The emergence of open source and use of deep learning frameworks is brand new. And so buyer beware. Think about how you make this stuff work well for you. So these are some of the challenges. What we're seeing, though, is we believe that open source frameworks are going to continue to dominate. Um, that it's going to be important to integrate these frameworks like TensorFlow into your analytic ecosystem, into technologies like Teradata and Hadoop. That it, having GPUs, it's great to use them in the cloud, but they don't scale very well in the cloud and that they're quite expensive. So having high quality GPUs at scale is going to be critical on premise. And that this is going to continue to be a very open ecosystem. That anybody that's offering proprietary black boxes for AI, you should run away. I mean, I don't think that's a message that's going to be a surprise to an environment like this that's based on community open source. We see that being critical in the AI space. So with that, what we're really excited about at Teradata, I, I'm actually in a new role focused on helping us create the services, solutions, and products integrating into our portfolio to make it ha possible to have deep learning for the enterprise with high performance, with manageable results, and operationalizing it. Right? So we are, we are not taking the stance of, hey, here's a checkbox, we too are doing AI, nor are we taking the stance of hyping that everything is AI, but we think it's something that is going to unlock so much value from the investments you're making in your data ecosystem, and it's a very exciting time to be applying AI in the enterprise. Thanks for your time this morning. All right, Ron, thanks very much, John. So I think Ron did a good job of kind of giving us some of the insights on artificial intelligence. Of course, we at Hortonworks agree with him in terms of open source being the way that's going to drive some of these uh, new and more emerging technologies forward, or even the next generation of some of the existing technologies. Um, tied us all the way back to some of the things we heard on, on day one in terms of GPUs um, and other use cases for artificial intelligence. So that was a good way to kind of bridge things together and tie, and also, also of course, bring in the, the community aspect of it. So for our next presenter, um, the 
first data-related job for our, this presenter goes all the way back to when there were punch cards um, at a company called Decision Systems, which uh, you know, he claims would be um, used before many in the audience were, uh, were born. I'm not sure that's completely true, because I certainly remember punch cards myself. Um, but the fun fact, and I pressed him on this, his fun fact was he said that there's absolutely nothing fun about me and everybody knows it now. <laughs> I thought that was funny in and of itself, um, in a self-deprecating kind of way. And then uh, uh, one of the people who's traveling with him said, no, it's actually true. So <laughs> anyway, very pleased to bring up Joe Goldberg from BMC. Joe? Give me your, give me your, give me your attention, baby. I had to get you on that one. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, you know, BMC has been coming to Hadoop summits and now DataWorks summits for about five years. So we're in that three to five year category. Uh, and we've seen, like I think you've heard from a number of other speakers here, this progression and the shift from focusing on technology more to focusing on business value. We think that that's a pretty good indication of the fact that we are actually going mainstream, moving towards the enterprise. And that's great news for us because we've come to this space from the enterprise. I think we were one of the few, perhaps only, management solutions vendors that came from the enterprise and entered the Hadoop space all those years ago. From our perspective, we run and manage batch business workloads in an enterprise context. That's kind of the, you know, the workhorse of the enterprise, but nobody really thinks about batch until they go to the enterprise and until something fails. And that's when, as the big data teams and big data applications are moving toward the enterprise, they're beginning to discover that the enterprise is a pretty scary, complex place. I don't think I need to convince this audience, at least I hope not, that big data is kind of in the throes of full throttle adoption. Uh, but perhaps as evidence of that is the fact that what we are seeing from almost every customer we talk to is that they are engaged in replacing what a sort of mainstay foundation technologies in their enterprise environments, things like enterprise data warehouses that are being augmented and offloaded onto the big data ecosystem. And you know, when you do that, by definition, you have to be able to integrate with everything that's in the enterprise already. Because enterprises, and I think technology in general, kind of like an, architectural, an ar archaeological rather science where we layer stuff on top of stuff, and you have to integrate with everything that's been there in the past in addition to whatever the new technology is that you're bringing. And when you do that, that's when you encounter an enterprise that is significantly different than it was just a short couple of years ago. So we believe that you need to take a sort of platform approach to doing automation for your business applications in an enterprise that has tremendously diverse infrastructure, very dynamic, and not only the big data that you're bringing, but of course having to process all of the data that already exists in the enterprise and be able to build and deliver applications using modern application delivery methodologies like DevOps or continuous CI, CD, continuous pipelines. So what are the characteristics of this kind of a platform? Well, first, if you consider the diversity and complexity of the infrastructure, enterprises today are comprised primarily of not only their traditional distributed systems platforms, but private and public cloud, called either the multi-source or hybrid cloud. There's containers, there are cluster managers, in addition to technologies like Hadoop and Yarn, there's also Mesos and Kubernetes. There's also traditional sort of mainframe and you know, other legacy environments. In addition to the hardware or the infrastructure complexity, there is this massive application sprawl. You know, nowadays we are seeing more applications and more components of a business service than have ever existed before. And in order to be able to automate and manage this kind of an application, we feel you have to be able to sort of abstract all this hyper-heterogeneity, which is almost as hard to say as it is to do, uh, 
and be able to present a sort of a business layer that lets you understand how all of the components that make up your business services relate to each other so that you can ensure that you are monitoring them successfully and seeing that end-to-end -end view. Of course, if you're going to the enterprise, enterprise grade implies that it's got to be scalable, easily deployable, it's got to be secure, you've got to have auditing and KPI metrics and dashboards, you've got to have version control and forecasting and just a myriad functions that are taken for granted in an enterprise environment. I think the enterprise is just as complex in terms of the users as it is in terms of its infrastructure and technology stack. So when you have big data applications that have the relative luxury of an isolated or insulated environment with a relatively small or well-defined set of users, the technology, the user interfaces become somewhat less important, perhaps, than they do when you get to the enterprise, where you have a very broad range of users. And you have to be able to accommodate a variety of users, that some of which, or many of which, either will not or cannot invest the time to learn how to use the tools and the technology in order to be able to exploit and leverage that technology for their business advantage. If you then look at you know, how do you manage and automate this collection of applications, you have to resist the tendency to fall to the lowest common denominator. And so if you're looking at how do you manage Hadoop specifically and the entire ecosystem, it means that you have to be able to use things like native APIs to start and track and monitor the workloads. You have to be able to aggregate application-specific, in this case, yarn logs, and bring them together and make them easily available to the people that have to analyze and debug problems when they occur. You want to be able to collect statistical information so that you can have predictive SLA monitoring to ensure that you are meeting your business requirements as these applications are in flight. And you have to be able to do that not just for the Hadoop applications or technologies, but of course everything that they tie into for this end-to-end -end business processes that you're going to be monitoring. And finally, you have to be able to deliver these applications using modern application delivery methodologies. From our perspective, we believe that means that the operational instrumentation or the plumbing that is required to automate and run these applications needs to be part of the application itself and built at the same time that you build the business logic. We call this approach jobs as code, meaning that the jobs that are run to actually operate and productionize, if you will, your application are part of the application that is created up front committed together with the business logic code that makes up the application, and then is promoted through a delivery pipeline in an automated fashion. So some of the customers that are taking advantage of such a platform, for one example is Amadeus. This is a company that has literally shaped the travel industry. They provide about 70% of all IT processing to the travel industry, and you can see by this statistic that they touch an amazing 95% of all travel or airline bookings commercially made globally. They're using such an automation platform to do everything from managing all of their bank reconciliation with all their financial partners, as well as things like delivering passenger manifests to security agencies like Department of Homeland Security so that aircraft are enabled to enter U.S. airspace. You can imagine what would happen if that application was not available 100% of the time. Now, in addition to that, they are now adding data-driven analytics to help them address both their own and their customer needs. They talk about what they call their look-to-book ratio. So I'm a pretty frequent flyer. I spend a lot of time looking at available flights, and when I'm looking, Amadeus is servicing those requests, but it's not getting paid. It's not until that I actually click and say buy that they're going to get paid. So if they can improve my experience by targeting the search list that, or the result list that I get to me so that I can reduce my searching and looking by just a little bit, that translates into massive savings for them. 
when you're running about 50 billion SQL queries a day, every little bit for each user is going to make a huge impact. At the same time, they are also re-hosting onto a brand new platform consisting of uh, Docker and Kubernetes and OpenShift running on top of OpenStack infrastructure. And they're able to do this completely seamlessly without making any changes to their 300,000 plus jobs that they run daily because they have taken this platform approach that supports both their traditional and new environments. And as they are integrating their analytics into this environment, it becomes simple and seamless for them to accomplish. Another customer is Navistar. They are the largest truck and school bus manufacturer in North America. You may know them by names like Harvester or International Harvester. And they have the usual set of traditional applications in their environment, as well as sensors that are streaming telematics data from each one of their vehicles on the road. This is coming into their environment via a public cloud environment. They are then enriching that data from their ERP and CRM systems with parts and customer and warranty information coming from mainframe environments. The resulting connected vehicle program allows them to detect a potential part failure, determine the nearest service center, schedule either, well, determine whether the part to fix or replace that problem is available in the service center, if not, have it shipped, schedule an appointment, and notify the driver. This has resulted in a 40% reduction in what they call dwell time, which is the amount of time a vehicle spends waiting for a service and is unavailable. You can imagine how this delights their customers when you can reduce or increase the amount of your vehicle availability by such a huge percentage, resulting in direct impact to both top and bottom lines for their customers. And so if you are interested in any of these kind of benefits, if you'd like to talk to us about how you might be able to take advantage of a digital business automation platform, come by, talk to us at Booth 300. We're a control M from BMC Software. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much. I'm boring about that. That was a good presentation. Thank you. Okay, some good use cases there, and uh, how that. Uh, I actually thought there's a lot of trucking. We've heard a lot about trucking here and trucking uh, demonstrations. So, now, I'm excited about this next section and this next presentation. Hope you are. This is where we're going to talk about Hadoop 3.0 um, and what's coming, what are the key concepts that are driving the next release of the core platform, uh, and we're going to see a presentation. So on my right, very excited to have two leading uh, engineering leaders okay, from Hortonworks to bring up Vinod and Ram. Thanks very much, gentlemen. And then leading the overall presentation to give us kind of the background of what's happening for this. Um, excited to, uh, to have someone who's been working with the technology, started at Yahoo, worked with the technology for more than 10 years. So if you're writing a job description and it says, must have at least 10 years of Hadoop experience, there's really only a handful of people on the planet that can, that can do that. It's also somebody who uh, uh, has been doing their 10th um, Hadoop Summit. Uh, so someone who has a tremendous amount of experience in this venue. So very excited to bring up Arun Murthy, uh, co-founder of Hortonworks. Arun? Thanks, John. There you go. All right. Flying, folks. Whoa. It's a lot of lights here. Um, hopefully, you all have been having fun the last couple of days. Uh, it's been our pleasure, you know, both with, uh, you know, Yahoo and Hardenworks, and also as the rest of the Hadoop community to bring this for you. It's been uh, a, an incredible journey over the last, you know, 11, 12 years of Hadoop. And as you've probably noticed, we've, you know, kind of taken Hadoop forward in many different dimensions. It started off all the way back in 2005, six time frame where Hadoop was all about, you know, HDFS and MapReduce, the whole ecosystem evolved. Um, it went from batch to being, you know, the Hadoop 2 architecture with, you know, the data lakes and all the different workloads. And now what I want to talk to you a little bit about is sort of where we want to take Hadoop next, right? As we see Hadoop becoming more and more mainstream, we've had a number of customers, number of enterprises take Hadoop in different you know, shapes and forms. Technologies like Spark, technologies like Flink, technologies like Ranger and Atlas, they've been really, really important to actually move Hadoop forward. 
And now if you look, look at the next you know, five, six, 10 years, we sort of see a number of areas where we have to continue to move Hadoop. A big one, um, I would say, is around security and governance. Because without that, as Hadoop becomes sort of the system of record or the system of insight, without security and governance, that's not going to be you know, feasible for Hadoop to move forward. Similarly, as we move from you know, standard Hadoop, MapReduce, Spark, Flink kind of applications, more and more ISVs, whether it's data processing or analytics or machine learning or deep learning or any of these, they're coming onto the platform. So we as a community have to make sure all of these can actually run on the Hadoop platform. Last not least, um, all of the, anything we have to do, um, has to do has to work in the cloud. I would, I would actually go far as so far as to say that cloud has been one of the most interesting challenges or one of the most interesting sort of uh, changes that's uh, brought to Hadoop in the last you know five years. If you look at the architecture of Hadoop and it was built for sort of um, you know co co-located storage and so on, but now with cloud disaggregated storage services and microservices, these are really pushing Hadoop in interesting architectural ways. So let's talk a little bit about cloud first up, and then I can come back and talk to you a little bit about the applications. To talk about cloud, um, I'll, I'm going to have Ram walk you through what we're thinking in the cloud. Cool. All right. Thanks, Arun. Good morning, everyone. You know, I can't believe it's just been a year since at the same venue last year, we announced Hortonworks Data Cloud as our offering for running Hadoop-based workloads in the cloud. And at that time, basically, we had two tenets in the architecture. One was we talked to you about ephemerality. You know, think of landing your data in a cloud object store like S3 or WASB or ADLS, and then process that using workload-specific clusters instead of you know, large multi-tenant things where you're running a whole bunch of workloads together. Over the course of the year and 16 releases later, we've added a ton of functionality based on your feedback. So we added things like spot instances and tagging and auto scaling and you know, worker node fault tolerance, encryption at rest. I'm sure I'm missing a few more. Up until like this week, we announced uh, Hotmooks Data Cloud 1.16 as GA, where you now have the optional capability to get enterprise support through the flex subscription mechanism that's built into the product. So as we were doing that and as we had these conversations with you and you know, many other folks we had these conversations with that in the audience. What you told us along the way was you said, you know, Ram, this is a, we like your DevOps focus. We like the uh, self-service reduced operational footprint of what you're offering. But before we can really take it to production, we have you know, business critical sensitive data on-prem. Before we actually can operate on that in the cloud, we need the same enterprise class security and governance the controls that we have around access control and auditing and compliance that we have on-prem, we want these same capabilities in the cloud before we can confidently move workloads to the cloud. Right? And you also told us, you know, clearly this is something that we see you, Hortonworks, as significantly differentiating yourself from everyone else in the space. So we took that to heart, and we've been hard at work in, on implementing the strategy, and I'm really excited today to announce Hortonworks Data Cloud 2.0 with support for long-running shared services for schema, security, and governance. Rather than talk you through PowerPoint, why don't I just switch to the demo and show you a real-world scenario that uses this. Okay. It's OK. If you can't see all the text on this, it's going to get a little better in a bit. So I have a standard uh, a scenario from the financial services sector. So let's say you're a large bank, and we call it Hortonia Bank, of course. Um, and you have a, a customer data set in your bank. And let's say over time, you've really got to know your customers. So you can see I have some standard things here. I'm browsing this data set through Tableau. So you can, you can access Hortonworks Data Cloud data in there from Tableau or any of your other you know, industry standard BI tooling. So I have like, information about the customer, first name, last name, address, and so on but I also have some stuff that looks fairly sensitive. So as a data steward or a data curator, you want to make sure that certain policy controls are ad adhered to. For example, if you have uh, customers in the EU, you want to make sure that only your EU employees have access to the data. If you have uh, 
analysts who need to, to use this data set to do some data mining, that the data is actually presented in the right form for them, including controls like masking and so on. So how would you do this? The way you would do it is you would go to Ranger, right? Let me make sure I'm logged into Ranger. So this is the same Apache Ranger that's part of Hotmox Data Platform. I'm showing you the latest version that's, uh, that's part of uh, HTTP 2.6. Let us see how kind the demo guards are going to be today. I did not break a coconut. <laughs> this is going to cost me. No. OK, here we go. All right. Wide. So I have Ranger up here, and uh, we have a few different ways of uh, administering this data set. From an access standpoint, I have a few access policies defined against this data set, where I told you, for example, EU countries and EU customers have specific access controls. I talked a little bit about masking. So for example, here I want to make sure that if I ever display a credit card number, I only show the first four digits. Um, na last four on the national ID, so on and so forth. Or if, if there are things like passwords, I just want to completely hash them and never show them to the, to the end user, right? The third kind of policies I can apply to this data set have to do with row level filtering. So for example, you can see I have a policy here on the worldwide customers table. And we make sure that if you are from one of the EU countries, and we know now that this is a variable, not a constant, so we made this a table. So if your country is in the EU country's table, then you have access to just that segment of the customers in that data set. So the key thing to kind of keep track of here is that these are all the standard mechanisms that you would use on-prem to administer policies. You know, one of the things you told us was, we'd really like to do this once, please, and definitely not once for every ephemeral cluster that we spin up, right? So once you have these policies defined centrally, then you can, we can see what the, uh, the analyst experience is going to look like. Right? So at this point, I'm just logged in as Joe Analyst using my same Active Directory credentials. Now we're going to really roll the dice. Let me go run this query where Joe is trying to get some information about this customer data set. This query, if all goes well, should take about five to six seconds. There you go. And you can see that the result that came back uh, the, the name is fine, but all of the masking policies that we asked to be applied were actually applied onto this data set. And just for grins, let me switch to another user who's helpfully been named as Ivana from the European Union. And let's say she tries to access the US customers table. Okay. So this is an example of where it's okay for the demo to have an error. In fact, we want it, right? So what this is telling us is that she was denied access to this data set. And if I switch back, let's take a quick peek at uh, Ranger's audit logs. There you go. So this was all integrated in. I showed you the standard mechanisms for authentication through Active Directory, authorization through Ranger, and then audit through the Ranger mechanisms for auditing. Right? So that's. All pretty standard stuff if you are an HTTP on-prem customer, but in the cloud, this gives you a powerful new capability. Now I'm going to spend just a couple minutes showing you how I set all of this up. OK, I'm going to log into Hortonworks Data Cloud. This is the same control plane, the UI, the CLI, and the API experience that I showed you last year. We just have a few more extensions to support this, this notion of shared security and governance. The first thing that I want to point out to you is, and this has always been a dream of mine to show you the awesome LDAP settings in a, in a large setting. So you can see here that this gives you a way now for you to bring your either your on-prem Active Directory or LDAP configuration, or if you happen to have one running in Amazon Directory Services, you can establish the right trust relationships with them, and then you can bring that in to Hardenworks Data Cloud as is. Right. So once you have your LDAP configured, and this is the key thing. So we added this concept of data lake services. The easiest way to think about data lake services is instead of just having data sitting in your object, cloud object store like S3, now you have a definition of data, metadata, the schema for the tables that you are operating against, 
the, the ranger policies as well as the atlas governance that goes with that. You define that once and you call that a data lake, right? So the process of creating a data lake typically involves actually specifying where all these different pieces are going to live. And one thing that I should point out is we stayed with the same notion of disaggregated storage. So these data lake services, they're long running, but if you are not using them, you can quiesce them all down to zero. Okay. Once you have a data lake defined, and like any good cooking show, we have one here called Hortonworks Data Lake. So now you can create a cluster directly from it. Right? This is that same integrated sort of one-click experience. And this cluster is automatically wired up with the, the right uh, settings to make sure that it has inherits all the policies from that central ranger system that you defined. And when this cluster comes up, you're ready to go with all of the access controls that you need in place already. Right. So this sort of gives you a quick drive-by of what the end-to-end -end experience looks like. We wanted to make sure that we preserved that lightweight, DevOps, workload-centric cluster experience, but we've also added security and governance on the side of it. Right. Switching back to the slides, please. Thank you. All right, so that basically the demo showed you in live what we uh, have on this, on this slide here. So finally, some last thoughts for you is all of the innovation that we've, you've seen over the last year has been driven by you and what you've asked for. So please, there's a few more new offerings that we are really excited to announce today. The first one is uh, Hortonworks Data Cloud 2.0. Everything that I showed you today is available as a tech preview. The team pushed really hard to get the tech preview launched last night. So we really are eagerly waiting for your feedback. The first 100 folks who register and try it out, we have something special for you. So please go ahead and try this out. Also want to give out a, sh a shout out to our friends at Microsoft who've been doing the heavy lifting on the WASB and the ADLS connectors. So good news, all the connectors and the one for S3 are now generally available. They're part of HTTP 2.6.1, the latest maintenance release of HTTP. And lastly, everything that I showed you today, our cloud strategy, is underpin the underpinnings of that is the CloudBreak engine. So Hortonworks CloudBreak, we're also announcing, announcing a GA release of CloudBreak that supports the uh, Flex subscriptions that I talked about earlier. So on all of these releases, we really need your feedback. Um, looking forward to it. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Well, as you can see, we've, we've come a long way both um, as a community and as Hortonworks to really embrace the cloud. And you know, all the work we've done, over, I would say, over the last three or four years, along with our friends at Microsoft, where we you know, kind of helped them run HDI, has really helped inform both HDI and the you know, cloud products we have in, in different vendors to kind of you know, move really forward. So with that, let's take the next step and walk you through a little bit of you know, some of the other stuff I had on my slide back then. Right? This is about how we as a community need to enable not just the standard Hadoop workloads. You know, historically, it's been um, Spark and MapReduce and Flink and Storm and so on, but also bring newer experiences and the experience which are built by either the open source community or ISVs or you know, great partners like IBM. So to walk you through that, uh, let's have, uh, I'd like to you know, um, call upon Vinod, who, by the way, uh, has sort of the unique distinction of not only spending more than 10 years on the project, but it's also it's the only thing he's ever done in his life, in his career. It's kind of right. crazy. All right. Thanks, Arun. Have fun. All right. So uh, in this part of the presentation, I would like to uh, focus a little on what we in the community are doing in Apache Hadoop 3 Auto, and a few things that we as Hardworks are doing. And b before I go into that, I want to give a quick shout out to the uh, Apache community, without which we'll not be here. Thank you, Apache. So uh, quick. You know, overview of how things are evolving in the 3.0 land. Um, so you, you have Hadoop storage at the bottom. It's evolving it to, you know, into uh, supporting more variety of uh, data sets and also different use case patterns. You have cold tire, uh, hot tire, you know, with archival uh, and tiered storage. Now you can actually move your data as it goes through uh, its evolution, right? And, and with more things like erasure coding, you can have more storage efficiency and so on. On top of that, you have Yarn-based uh, uh, data operating system. In addition to supporting traditional resources like 
the memory and CPU. Now we are working in the community to add GPU support, FPGAs, et cetera. On top of this platform, you have a whole bunch of applications. Arun has talked about you know, some of the traditional big data workloads like MapReduce, Park, Hive, and so on. We are bringing more workloads into this platform. Now let's switch over to, uh, to the demo. So a, a quick summary before I explain what we're doing here. Uh, this is a sneak peek of a cluster that we brought up in the cloud. It has uh, Apache Hadoop 3.0 bits plus a bunch of uh, you know, in-progress work in branches and, and patches, and the user experience that we at Hotworks have been working on. So what you're seeing here is uh, Ambari 3.0. It, it, it's, it's code on trunk. Don't try this at home. Um, it has new user experience with streamlined you know, notifications, events, et cetera. On this cluster, you have the, the minimal set possible. As I showed in the, uh, in the slide over there, we are splitting the platform into platform from the application so that the applications and workloads can evolve much faster and independently. So you have Yarn HDFS at the bottom. This is your uh, in a well-known uh, storage system along with support for edit recording, et cetera. This is the user interface for Yarn that we've had for 10 years. We, for those of you who have attended a few sessions from, and community updates, uh, we have a new user experience at Yarn, which showcases a uh, bunch of information that was latent in the platform and helps both operators and users to get to information faster. For example, you can go look at the, uh, you know, find users and applications who are use, using resources the most. It has a more visual representation of how queue utilization is. It also has uh, a node-centric view, and you know, in one, one pane, you can actually look at all the nodes and see how uh, the resource usage is. Right? So this is the platform. On top of that, we have uh, built our own user experience what I call as the data OS experience. Here, the, one of the first concepts I want to introduce is the notion of an assembly store. For those of you who have, who have been here uh, last year, I've introduced the notion of an assembly, which the goal of assembly is to simplify big data, right? Uh, we want to appify everything uh, you know, uh, that you want to run in a big data cluster. So you have the, uh, the low, lowest level platform enabling uh, workloads. As you can see here, uh, we have a bunch of applications that we've been working over the last year uh, with the community and otherwise. So you have traditional uh, workloads like Zookeeper, Storm, HBase, and Kafka uh, that are already available. In addition, there are other complex pieces, two of which I want to focus today, are A, IBM DSX experience uh, tool. So in the last couple of days, you've, you might have gone through, uh, you might have listened to a bunch of announcements around how IBM DSX improves data science uh, tooling uh, and brings uh, machine learning uh, to the masses. In this demo, we, we're, we're actually going to show how you can run an instance of IBM DSX on your on-prem clusters or cloud clusters uh, uh, with a single-click deploy, and you can have as many as you want. The second part of the demo is I'm going to show uh, how you can do uh, deep learning uh, using an example of a self-driving car. Let's get right into it. Hopefully, Ram has slayed enough demons for the demo guards. So we want to make the simple experience simple and complex experience possible. So if you don't want to change anything, you can actually go do a one-click deploy of an HBS app. Before we do that, let's quickly you know, go through what this definition looks like. As an app developer who's bringing new apps to this platform, all he has to do is he has to define the components in this, uh, in this application. And one thing I've kind of glossed over is all of these are containerized apps. So you can test your application on your, on a, on your laptop in containers and then bring to uh, Yarn in a very easy manner. So let's do that. This takes a few, uh, few seconds. OK, there was a conflict over there. So now we have submitted this app. Uh, it'll take uh, anywhere between half a minute uh, to a minute to come up. So instead of wasting time, let's go and submit a few more applications. So let's go uh, look at Kafka. Kafka has a bunch of brokers. Like I said, we want to make simple things easy. So you can, in this pane itself, you can go up update you know, how much resources you want. Let's say you want to uh, launch five Kafka brokers instead of three. You can make that change and it, it gets accepted. Let's also submit our IBM uh, uh, DSX application. OK, and finally, our uh, self-driving car. So 
All right, so some of these apps have started running. Let's go uh, inspect one of these apps first. Um, so this is a running uh, view of the application. Again, uh, we want to surface the uh, absolutely important information up front over here. So we have an HBS master. I've uh, selected one region server. And each of these containers are running on Yarn and inside Docker. And that ties back to the uh, point I made. You can test this stuff on your laptop first before you bring it to the platform. Let's go and see the uh, dashboard. All right, so let's go into uh, data science experience. So data science experience, like I mentioned before, is, is a category of applications which we call as an assembly because it's made up of a bunch of other applications. As you see here, uh, through uh, DSX, you can do uh, Zeppelin notebooks, RStudio, Jupyter, and so on, and there's a user interface uh, application container which is also running uh, on top of Yarn. Let's see if this application is up and running. So again, you might have already seen some of this uh, user experience uh, at IBM Meetup and uh, uh, their booth. So quickly show that this is indeed real. You know, I'll bring up the RStudio interface uh, that DSX embeds, right? So uh, there are a few things here. Uh, it's not just that the uh, application is running inside uh, inside Yarn. It also has access to other you know, uh, tools that are running in the cluster. Like, for example, you can go here, create a connection to Spark that's already installed in the cluster, and, and, and do a bunch of things. Let's get back to uh, uh, the front page for DSX. You can also add your own notebooks. You can go, go here, you know, uh, click Add no Notebook. And I'm just taking a few stock examples that somebody else has already created and shared it with me. And it comes up in no time, right? And you can do the same stuff that you know, Ram was showing before. So that's, that's DSX. Uh, you can bring as many as you want because you're running in a shared in, uh, environment. This is very good for dev test scenarios, right? And with a little bit more work, you can run it in production. Now let's go to the last part of my demo. Let's go back to the dashboard. The self-driving car application is running. So a quick you know, uh, introduction of what this application is, right? Uh, as you guys have been who have been following this space, self-driving car is, in my mind, the, uh, you know, the culmination of a lot of things coming together. You have big data, deep learning, and of course, smart algorithms, which can uh, you know, take what we experience in real life and add a lot of value to it. Um, so this, this specific demo, uh, we have uh, a single container, what it has is, is it's a Zeppelin notebook which internally also deals with TensorFlow. So the demo uh, will show you how, you know, uh, in a batch manner, we can take a model that is already built and feed it an input and show how, you know, the vehicle actually sees the world, right? And there. So this is Zeppelin Notebook. I already have an application that I've built before. Uh, quick credits uh, to the folks who've been working on this project. So uh, we've taken some of this from uh, the Udacity project called Self-Driving Car. It's an open source self-driving car initiative. Uh, and it uses internally uh, TensorFlow and uh, a specific uh, model tool called Darkflow. And Wang Datan from Hortonworks, he's put it all together uh, for a demo. Let's change the application name. So to make the demo fast, I've already populated the image with the uh, input video. So this is the input to the model. Let's give it a few seconds to load. So this is the input data. You're looking at a car that is going through mountain view, stopping at a light, you know, a bunch of things are happening and you want a, a real self-driving car to actually re react to all these events, right? So the first step in this is we take this video, split it into a bunch of pictures, because the model works on pictures, using FFmpeg. That should be a fast thing. And we're done. We then use TensorFlow, which is embedded in, inside the container where Zeppelin itself is running. We use the Darkflow tool to detect objects in each of these images. This will take a bit of time. 
This is running in the cloud uh, on a real uh, cluster which has uh, Hadoop 3 bits. I don't have GPUs here. That's the reason why uh, it, it's a little uh, slow. With GPUs, you can expect that uh, this batch scoring uh, runs much faster. Any time now. All right, so that finished. So what it has done is it has gone through a whole bunch of uh, inference cycles and j took each of these images and, and tagged them. Now we use FFmpeg to stitch all these pictures back again into a video. So that's done. And drum rolls, if we have done things well, we should have an output video which recognizes objects. There you go. So it is taking the input video, you know, split into pictures, identify objects. As, as you can see, it's identifying a whole bunch of different cars, traffic lights, sometimes even trees. And yeah. You guys see the bug there? It missed one traffic light. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the TensorFlow demo. Uh, I want to quickly summarize what we have done here. Um, so you have all sorts of different applications, assemblies, and apps. You can run your own. It's, it's very good for dev test scenarios. You can bring your own HPS Kafka Storm. Uh, with a little more work, you can run it in production. Um, there are a few more things that I would like to talk more. So one of the apps you might have, I might have glossed over is this HTTP 2.6 app. What we are really do doing is, because it's all containerized, you can actually bring up a full-blown HTTP cluster instance on, on this container framework. Uh, so that's, again, something that's very useful for dev test scenarios. That finishes uh, the demo. Let's go back to uh, summarizing what we have seen so far. So overall, uh, Hadoop 3, as with Hadoop 2, is, is making a major uh, uh, shift in how we look at things in big data. Uh, we've introduced the notion of assemblies. We, we're working hard to br bring this to you. Um, and we didn't shop at that. Since last year, uh, where we gave a sneak peek of how things look, should look like, we have taken this platform. We are running this internally. Uh, as a container cloud on Yarn. All of Hortonworks' releases and uh, CI and CD process go through this platform. So if, if you're touching a HTTP release, it's actually tested on top of uh, Yarn, right? We have, uh, we have a cluster of hundreds of nodes and uh, hundreds of users in Hortonworks use this platform. We have run millions of containers so far, uh, and we hope to bring uh, most of this uh, to you guys soon. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks, Renee. As you can see, um, all of us uh, want to again give a shout out to the community. None of this will be possible without you guys, but this is taking Hadoop um, all the way from you know sort of a batch platform to a multipurpose platform to a platform where you can actually truly do business applications and solutions at scale. With that, thank you again for your attention. Enjoy the rest of the show. Um, see you back next year. All right. Thanks. Take that. Arun, Vinod, Ram, that was great. So got a chance to see where the technology is going. I uh, noticed it was probably amongst the, uh, if not the loudest applause for both of those demos. So really getting right back to our roots, looking at a little bit of code and, uh, and seeing some more live demos. So that was great. And, uh, and I think everybody enjoyed that. Now I want to bring up uh, another member of the community, one that will give us some additional insight. Not as tech heavy as the, uh, the presentation we just saw, so we'll kind of switch back and forth there. Um, our next presenter, his first data-related job is that he was an analyst at uh, Forrester for six years, so should be able to give us some good and, and interesting insight. Um, first and fun fact is uh, he, one of his first things he did way back when was put a point of sale system in for a bike shop that he was working in. Um, but by his own self-admission, he did a very, very poor job of it. The whole thing crashed, um, and they weren't able to do sales. They had to bring in an outside agency to fix it. So uh, you know, a little bit of a fail to start things off. But I guess the bike shop's still in, uh, still in business, so, so they're OK. Anyway, I want to bring up our next uh, speaker, Paul Sondreger from Oracle. Paul? <clears throat> there you go. Good luck. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm happy to report that the bike shop survived my complete incompetence in uh, Novell network topology. They're still, they're fine. 
Well, this morning, uh, for our brief time here together, um, we're going to talk a little bit about strategy, the bigger picture around all of this data stuff, um, and also um, encourage you, I hope, a little bit that you are continuing in a grand tradition uh, by making new things out of data. Um, and one of the great moments in this grand tradition came from Edmund Halley. So Edmund Halley, the famous astronomer, predicted when you will die. The comet thing came later. In 1693, Halley published a paper that analyzed life expectancy based on meticulously kept birth and death records from a little town called Breslau, which is in modern-day Poland. These Records capture the number of people who were born every year, the number of people who died, and at what age. And so using these observations, Halley could calculate if you were at age X, what was the likelihood that you would live to age Y? And using these observations, he was able to show that the annuities England was selling at the time in order to finance the war of the day were wildly underpriced if you were in your 20s. If you were in your 20s, you should go out and buy one of these things. He also used the data to calculate the number of fighting age men in the population to go fight the war, so maybe it balanced out. But the point for us this morning is that Halley's data, the data he analyzed, was not his own. It came from Caspar Newman who was the pastor in the main church in Breslau. So all of the data that backed up this analysis wasn't Halley's at all. It had to come from someplace else. And this brings us to a critical point for our modern day and our data economy. And that is that data is a kind of capital. Now, this is not a metaphor. This is not data is the new oil, data is the new gold, data is the new electricity, although that one is particularly good. What we're saying is that data fulfills the literal economic textbook definition of capital. Data capital is the recorded information necessary to produce a good or service. So if you don't have the data you need for this new AI recommendation engine or dynamic pricing engine, you cannot deliver the service you have in mind. The same way that if you don't have any aluminum, you can't make an Audi. Data is a kind of capital. It's not just a record of what happened. It's a raw material for creating digital goods, services, and ways of working. Now, this has big implications for competitive strategy. And to talk about strategy, uh, we turn, of course, to Michael Porter, uh, who is the world's foremost authority on competitive strategy at Harvard Business School. And Porter tells us that strategy is creating unique value in a unique way. It's not enough to offer a product your customers can only get from you. You have to deliver it and create it in a way your rivals cannot easily copy. And so your job as data scientists, data strategists, connoisseurs, is to create unique stocks of data capital and use them in unique ways. And to think about this, you can turn to the three principles of data capital. And the three principles of data capital are, one, data comes from activity, two, data tends to make more data, and three, platforms tend to win. So let's take a look at each of these in turn. Let's start with the first one. Data comes from activity. Now, you know this. You've been talking about this for nearly 72 hours now. But here is the implication for a competitive strategy. You are in competition for data. Remember, the data that Halley analyzed wasn't his. It came from Newman. No Newman, no data. No data, no paper, no paper, no deal of the century on mispriced annuities. Con contrary to conventional wisdom, data is not abundant. Yeah, there's a lot of it, but data consists of countless unique observations and they come from activity in the real world. If your company is not part of an activity when it happens, your opportunity to capture its data is lost forever. It does not come back. 
So part of your job is to look out at the world and see the data that is not there, to see the information that is evaporating off of these analog activities like so much steam. Go out, digitize them, and datify them before your rivals do. And from this perspective, the most important activities to focus on are those that your company conducts with customers or with partners, with some party outside of your own four walls, because that's where your competition could beat you to the punch. The second principle of data capital is that data tends to make more data. And here's where our modern ability to capture data and crunch it leaves Halley and Newman far behind. Incredibly, Halley actually made all of his calculations by hand on paper. It took forever. It's always good to give data to people so they can make decisions that would leave them better off than they otherwise would be. That's good. But you guys all know that the real money is in algorithms. And part of the reason is not just because they can act far beyond human scale and speed and in terms of the observations they can crunch. Part of the reason the money is in algorithms is because algorithms create data about their own performance, which can be fed back into the model to improve their future performance. Now, you already know this. This is a staple of machine learning. Some statisticians would say it's a staple of statistical methods as well. Uh, and there'll be a fight by the flagpole at 3 o'clock between statisticians and ML people. You should not miss it. But this creates a competitive advantage that is very, very hard to catch. The virtuous cycle of algorithms that take observations about their own effectiveness, which then can be fed back into the model to improve their future effectiveness, is creating a whole family of companies around fraud detection, around inventory management, uh, around running paper mills, so that the run of paper is more effective every single time the mill runs. This is the second principle of data capital, that data tends to make more data. The third is that platforms tend to win. Now, in the technology industry, we all know this. We've seen this for decades. Um, but, but let me just call out here, we're not talking here about platforms the way that technologists talk about them. We're talking about platforms as economists see them. And economists talk about platforms in terms of a platform business model. A platform business model serves a two-sided market. Take credit cards. You have consumers on one side, merchants on the other. We all want to carry the card, more merchants will take. Merchants want to take the card, more of us have. Growth on one side of the market tends to encourage growth on the other. Platform competition tends toward a winner-take-all outcome. And with the digitization and datification of more daily activities, platform competition is coming for industries that have never seen it before, like agriculture, like healthcare, like manufacturing. All right, so these principles apply to all companies, global multinationals and startups alike. What are you going to do? Well, I have good news. Oracle can help. So you know I'm going to say that. You know I'm going to say we've got some great stuff that you ought to try out. We do. You should. But that's not what I'm going to dwell on here. Uh, the thing that I do want to point out to you is that the way that we think about cloud is it's basically a new kind of computer. And it needs to have all the pieces fitting together. So we've got these tiers, data as a service at the top, data for sale, software as a service, analytics, apps, algorithms, platform as a service, platform development services, not just uh, sort of development services in addition to data management and integration services, and then infrastructure as a service at the bottom. But let me give you two ideas about why uh, this full stack hybrid cloud approach is so important. First one is data trade, the buying and selling of data. The second one is data liquidity. So remember Halley and Newman. Halley's whole work was based on data he did not own. He needed somebody else to give it to him. Well, we live in a day and age where we now know that data is incredibly valuable. And so it's not about giving it away, it's about selling it in some way. Oracle runs this very large um, third-party data marketplace. It's called Oracle Data Cloud. It's full primarily of browsing and um, shopping history um, on consumers, fully anonymized, uh, in some cases with unique identifiers so we can tie it across channels, but without personally identifiable information. Five billion profiles, 400 million business profiles. It includes roughly $4 trillion in online and offline transactions. And this data is now available to companies that did not originate it for purposes the originators never imagined. 
a tiny little marketing company in Atlanta started a, they, they did a, a small marketing campaign for a real estate development firm in order to target on mobile and in Facebook people who were likely to buy retirement homes near golf courses. And this small firm who didn't have any consumer browsing or history or shopping data of their own was able to source that data through the marketplace and then use it to deliver a 429% ROI on that campaign. So data trade is uh, the first big idea here. The second one is data liquidity. And with data liquidity, what we're talking about is getting the data you want into the shape you need for the task at hand. Now, all of you know the heartbreak of ETL, now ELT, and how much time you spend in data munging. Well, one of the things that we're trying to do is make it easier to get data from multiple repositories into some new combination for some new purpose, and to do it really fast, to do it really easily, because you don't yet know what that new combination will be worth to you. You don't know it until you, after you have it. And so we're creating things like Big Data SQL. It's not just SQL on Hadoop, but it is full Oracle SQL that will take a query and using metadata about where the data lives in Hadoop, in NoSQL, in a relational database, we'll cut that query up and execute it locally. And it doesn't hand it off to some third-party execution engine. It's an actual SQL execution engine on the Hadoop nodes, on the NoSQL nodes, in the database. It's blisteringly fast, and it all conforms to the same security parameters. When you take a big step back and look at what Oracle's strategy is. Oracle is reinventing enterprise computing as a set of services that are easy to buy and use. That is what the full Oracle portfolio is about. But let me leave you with this. If there is only one thing that you remember from our time together here, it should be this, that data is a kind of capital. It is not merely a record of what happened. It is raw material for creating new digital products, services, and ways of working. Halley's life table became the most important reference point for not just the life annuities business, but the emerging life insurance business for 100 years. The work that you are doing today in turning observations into new capabilities can have that kind of impact. That is exciting work, and that's work that we look forward to doing with you. Thanks very much. All right, Paul, thanks very much. OK, so a little bit on data capital and a nice little historical lesson on how important it is. So in between sessions, I go back and uh, you know, get a drink of water and what have you. But I also check the, um, the app to see. And uh, I want to give a shout out to somebody who's a bit of a rock star posting all the time, Subesh. D'Souza, Sebastian, there he is right there. Hey, stand up. <laughs> Thanks very much. You're a rock star on the app. We appreciate you using it. Great job, really posting and really positive. So just want to say thank you. Appreciate it. OK, so there you go. Um, so now, for our next uh, presentation, again, another member of the community. It's actually a great uh, presentation that, uh, that I previewed earlier today. Um, and this is somebody that, uh, that I go back pretty far with myself um, uh, in terms of a uh, working relationship. Uh, his first data job was back where we met, back at Business Objects, where he was a revenue uh, forecast analyst. So data job, crunching numbers, trying to figure out exactly where that company was going to go from a revenue standpoint. Fun fact is this person's last name is a palindrome. So I'll let you look it up and see what palindrome means if you don't already know. <laughs> uh, first name, uh, last name is a palindrome. So I'd like to bring, bring to the stage Bruno Ziza from AtScale. Bruno? Great job. Thanks, John. and one. Now, John, thanks for the great introduction. I know a lot of vendors come up to stage here to talk to you about their great products and their great services. But in the next five minutes, I want to talk about you and the future of data. And these five numbers are about where we're at today with the Hadoop market and where we're going to go. Now, three years ago, when we launched at scale, the market wasn't too hot on this idea that you could put business users and run 
interactive applications, analytics applications in front of Hadoop. In fact, about a month before we launched the company, Gartner announced that the majority of companies had really had not talked to them about doing anything interactive on uh, big data and Hadoop. Do you guys remember that? You don't remember? You know what? I'm going to give you some incentives to interact with me here. So when I, when I ping you, I want to hear some noise. So what I'm going to start doing is when I ask you a question, I'm going to reward you with a t-shirt. Do you guys remember that moment where Gartner said that no companies were actually using Hadoop? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, that's your first t-shirt. So, of course, you know, that was really a disconnect with what we felt. You know, we launched a company to essentially revolutionize BI on big data, and here we are, a large research firm telling us there's no market. So I picked up the phone. Actually, the first person I called was John, and I called all my friends in the Hadoop market, and together we launched the world's first and largest Hadoop maturity survey. 3,000 people answered that survey, and what we found out actually was quite surprising. The first thing we found out is that a large portion of you, actually 70% of companies were already using Hadoop and big data, and they've been doing it for a year. 97% of the respondents told us that they were going to do more with Hadoop and big data over the next three months. And 75% of respondents told us that BI ahead of ETL and data science was the first workload they wanted to deploy on that platform. The industry had matured to a point that some of the research folks and the analysts actually hadn't picked up on it. Now, to give the industry uh, some credit, you know, the, the, the first time we started talking about Hadoop, we really talked about it as a replacement strategy. This idea that we could replace the EDW market with this new data platform. And when we looked again at the research data, we actually found that that was not true. Of course, there are stories of companies like this one, uh, a large insurance company that has um, deployed uh, Hadoop and has cut the cost of the infrastructure by 10x, and using AtScale has also improved the agility and the performance of their application by 35x. But as we work with large organizations across really all industries in our business, what we found is actually a few trends going on in this space. The first one is the majority of you that are doing big data are doing it in concert with the other platforms. 82% of you are actually not replacing. You're augmenting and doing something that's called optimization. What does that mean? Well, that means that your world today is going to become more complex. Your needs are complex already. You have Ten, hundred, thousands of business users interacting with applications like Excel and Tableau and maybe custom analytical applications you've built yourself. And while in the past you might have interacted those with Teradata and Etisa and SQL Server and those, you've over time augmented that with Hadoop on-premise, in the cloud. In the future, you're moving out to maybe non-Hadoop in the cloud as well. But you're not replacing. What is happening is you're having a very complex environment at the top of the stack with business users, a complex environment at the bottom of the stack, and you're trying to put humans in front of big data, and it's more and more complex. That is the reason why we created AtScale. And in fact, since that Gartner report, AtScale has grown 10x since we did that. So do you think that's pretty cool? Do you think we've got an opportunity? Yay! Yes. All right. One more t-shirt. Did I hear you guys over there? All right. Nice hit. All right. We know the cloud is disrupting. In fact, the last version of our survey said that 72% of you are moving to the cloud. This thing is really real. It's not a hype. It's not a buzzword. Your environment is becoming more diverse and more complex. Here's the question, though. As the presenter earlier was talking about data capital, you know, there's a lot of great taglines about data being the new oil. Do you guys know that we actually consume about 100% of the oil that we produce on a daily basis? Well, the reality with data is a little different. When we ask our respondents if they had self-service access to Hadoop, 53% of them say they still suffered from it. You're working, you're doing all that work to put the data in a great place, you're cleaning it, you're making it uh, ready to query, and more than half your users are actually not getting access to it. If you look at the data from The Economist just a month ago, 
they told us that 5% of the data that we capture actually makes it to the end of the business decision makers, the people that uh, need to make decisions with it. And even worse, remember the 100% oil consumption? How much of the data that we produce do we actually capture? 1%. So do we think that we have a great opportunity connecting humans to big data? We have a huge one. We have 99% of the data that we produce that has never made it. And so I'm going to give you this last t-shirt here. I'm going to throw it that way so I want to hear some noise. But what I want to make sure you do coming out of this session, go to our AdScale booth. It's booth 102. I don't think I can make it to you, sir. Um, <laughs> go to AdScale.com. I'm going to try. Go to AdScale.com. And more importantly, if you want to benchmark yourself against your peers, go and take the survey at atscale.com forward slash survey. Thank you very much for your attention, and let's try for this. All right, you guys have a good one. All right, Bruno. Thanks. You got quite the arm on you there. Hope nobody got hurt. He's uh, whipping those things out. That was great. Um, yeah, so go way back with Bruno. Now, for our final presentation, very excited. This is uh, more on the enterprise side and get some insight into how an enterprise is getting um, a value out of the platform. So I think we'll be very excited to know this next couple of presenters. Um, first fun fact, or first data job, I should say, sorry, is that this person was a global data consultant for Citicorp. So working in one of the major uh, banking organizations. And he built an in-house management information system product. So fun fact, uh, he's a percussionist. So maybe we'll hear some drums up here, bring this back out, I don't know. <laughs> and he's traveled to more than 40 countries, so spends a lot of time in planes. Second uh, presenter, so we've got two. This is a, a twofer uh, today for our last presentation. Um, was uh, uh, at Farmers Insurance. So we are farmers, you know that, right? Uh, leading distribution and analytics and business intelligence activity. And fun fact, um, she was a, a contestant on Wheel of Fortune, as we all know, and won more than $13,000, which actually must have done pretty well, spinning that wheel and, and guessing, those, uh, guessing those prizes. In addition, uh, also the captain of the uh, college dance team. So with that, I want to bring out Sesh Rangaranjan and Brianna Richards from Liberty Mutual. Please. Thanks, John. Sesh, there you go. Brianna, good luck. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sesh Rangarajan, and I have with me Brianna Richards. She's my business partner. Who said IT and business cannot be on the same stage? Uh, I'm of Indian origin where elephant is a sacred animal, and it's good to see this elephant is becoming sacred in the data world. We have a lot of elephant analogies. Bear with us. I think we've taken Hadoop elephant very seriously. <laughs> uh, the title again, you all see it, Can an Elephant Run Faster Than a Cheetah? Uh, many years ago, a famous CEO made the elephants to dance and brought about a company's historic turnaround. I think probably many of you would know what that company is. Uh, here we asked a question, can it run faster? Which is increase speed to market. And I have with me my business partner to keep us honest. You know I'll keep us honest. So this is a digital business these days. And insurance industry is going through a disruption uh, driven by exceptional technology advancement, such as cloud, big data, artificial intelligence, and shift in customer expectation. Liberty Mutual have been making the shift, and some people describe Liberty Mutual as technology business selling insurance, as opposed to insurance business, which happens to have technology. That's a big shift, especially in the insurance industry. Technology, cloud, Agile, data are the key strategic pillars for us to gain competitive advantage and increase speed to market.
So what do we got uh, in Liberty Mutual? As we started this transformation journey, we had an opportunity in our benefits business to build a greenfield modern data lake platform in cloud. AWS is our partner for this platform. Hortonworks HTTP forms the core of the data lake platform. And HDF for unified ingestion for both streaming and batch data. As we started this journey building this platform in the cloud, we fully adopted infrastructure as a code and DevOps approach. We have fully automated the provisioning of all services and tools within the Data Lake platform, zero touch deployment. So that's a big differentiator for us. Since we are all out in cloud, that's a big differentiator for us. I think over the process, to an extent, we were able to separate compute and storage. It took us a while to get that automation. It took us a while to get to that architecture. But today, we are seeing significant savings and benefits with that approach. I think some of it we all saw when Arun and his team talked about kind of the evolution of Data Lake, Data Lake 3.2, and Hortonworks Data Cloud. I think we already done some of it, and we are looking forward to some of the advancements Hortonworks is going to bring in that space. Security, again, being in the insurance space, security is very important to us. In addition to encryption at rest, in motion, on Kerberos, we are also using Atlas for tag-based security policies and dynamic data masking. We built machine learning routines to fingerprint the data, to automatically tag, to automatically build tags and security policies in Atlas and Ranger. So we are trying to include or bring in machine learning approach at the data foundation level itself. Largely, we talk about high-end use cases, but we are trying to bring in uh, that mindset at the data foundation level itself. We, we have OLAP and Hadoop at scale as our partner for, to build a semantic layer. Uh, we have multiple visual analytics tools, uh, all of them in cloud, accessing the data in cloud. We've rolled out Zeppelin Notebook to our data and data science community. We are now closely following some of the software. I think we heard this term, kind of data science as a team sport. I think we are looking for some of the software which will enable us to get there. And something like kind of GitHub for data science. I, I like that. Uh, there are some of the kind of software which is talking like GitHub for data science. So this is the technology platform that we built kind of over the last few years. Uh, and Brianna, what do you think of this technology? So, Sash, I think the technology itself sounds really exciting, but there's an elephant in the room. And it's what does all this technology actually mean to the business? And that's exactly what we asked ourselves about a year and a half ago when we started this journey in talking about the data lake. See, most of our key reports and our analytics were run out of our traditional environment. And what we really needed was a specific use case to implement the data lake. We were pretty hesitant to stand up a separate environment without this use case. So over the next few months, we actually identified that use case. We had a new system that we needed to implement within Liberty Mutual Benefits, and this system was actually going to capture information from the customer from submission all the way down to the sole policy. And if there was a claim on the policy, also track the claim. So the entire life cycle. The only problem with implementi implementing the new system was we needed reporting and analytics out of the system day one, and they actually wanted to implement the system in a very short time frame. So we had about nine months to do this. So we actually decided to leverage the data lake and the new technology in order to report and to, and to generate analytics out of the new system. So in, with, through the data lake ingestion processes and schema on read, we were able to actually access the raw data very quickly and actually self-serve on that data. So no longer was the information management team in the business responsible for documenting requirements for the proposed table structures we needed for reports. 
but we could access, access the data day one and actually adjust our queries on the fly as we needed to change the reports. And this was really a game changer. So when we launched the system day one, we were able to generate a lot of information around funnel analytics in the data pipeline in order to see where we were selling. We were also able to generate you know, sales insights to see which regions and areas we were growing. And because we were launching new products, we were also able to see which products were successful and which ones maybe we need to revisit our strategy. So all of this, you know, we did this by implementing an agile approach. We didn't use the waterfall approach of actually writing requirements and sending it over the fence to IT. We worked hand in hand with IT, uh, and as one team, we were able to deliver in two week sprints and iterate with the business on the change, any changes to requirements and any enhancements to the reports that they needed. And what, this was able to, what we were able to do is create a culture that was pretty nimble and flexible and was driven by the data. And what this all did was it enable an environment where we weren't sitting in the business waiting on IT, but we could self-serve, which also, you know, it really did change. It saved a lot of money. It changed kind of the game for us. We saved money in the business, and we also saved money in IT. So where are we going with the data lake? So as we look forward, we're really going to start leveraging the data lake to ingest uh, kind of our legacy system so our analysts can traverse across the data. So we can look across the new system and the old system and try to understand our customers a little bit better. What the platform also enabled was an environment where we read the data one, or we write the data one time, but then we read the data across a variety of different use cases. So we're using it right now for our operational BI. We have our reporting running out of the data lake for distribution, for finance, for underwriting, and product, and also claims. We can also generate diagnostic analytics and insights for our customers, our sales, and our losses. And we're, we're operationalizing predictive analytics through the lake through our fraud detection models and uh, generating additional uh, next best action kind of insights off the lake. So where are we going as we, we think about where we're going next? So any insurance company, as you know, has massive amounts of data, whether it be our legacy internal systems, any new system that we're implementing, or external data sets that we purchase to just try to understand our customers better. But the problem with massive amounts of data, you have to make sense of it. So we're actually looking into artificial intelligence and leveraging artificial intelligence in order to understand the data better. There was a survey done earlier this year uh, that actually 500 or more insurance executives were, were asked a question, how does artificial intelligence, how will it impact the insurance industry? 75% of the insurance executives believed that artificial intelligence will either greatly alter or completely transform the insurance industry over the next three years. And as such mentioned, that's where we're placing our chips. So we're leveraging machine learning in order to automate the exploratory analysis, that some of the exploratory analysis that's currently being done by the analysts. And what this will do is trigger, uh, give us information and hidden insights that we don't have today and save a lot of time. We're also going to leverage AI to drive down the costs for claims in our underwriting process. So for tr simple transactions, we can actually fully automate those transactions leveraging artificial intelligence. And as we think about other applications of artificial intelligence, looking into conversational agents and chatbots, right, in order to mimic the human interaction between the employee and the end customer in order to create that standardized customer service approach. All of these things you know, are, are good steps in order to drive you know, better operational effectiveness and grow the company. So we started this presentation with a question. Can an elephant run faster than a cheetah? And I think we're still early in our journey, but this new elephant and this new technology has enabled us to go much faster than what we thought was the fastest traditional approach. So I think we've been able to demonstrate our time to market was far superior. And with artificial intelligence, we're going to e move even faster than we can right now where we stand today. So we're, we're an over 100-year-old insurance company. We have a lot of data at this company. It's just a matter of unlocking that data and generating the insights we need. And with this new technology, we're now able to do it. I don't know if anybody were counting the number of times you were using the analogy. I think it was nine. <laughs> uh, Thanks, Brianna. So did I get an A plus in my report card with the technology? I think you got an A plus. Okay, Definitely it's official. A plus. It's in public now. Definitely. Thank Good. you, guys. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. All right.
Brianna, thank you. Sesh, great job. That's a great uh, uh, kind of insight in the importance of the partnership between business and uh, uh, IT in terms of driving the organization forward. Good to see a 100-year-old, 100-plus-year-old organization plans and, and even bringing back some of the things we've already talked about around uh, AI. Um, when I was backstage, somebody asked me, um, I've told everybody else's kind of first data-related job and their fun facts. I haven't said any about mine. Uh, so my first data-related job, my first thing I did, I wrote the uh, tracking system for uh, an experimental anti-submarine warfare system for the U.S. government. Um, so practice, uh, uh, analyzing sonar data coming off of big arrays. That's my first data-related job. Second, my, uh, my fun fact, I've had three kids on three different continents. Or my wife did, technically, but we had three kids on three different continents. So anyway, my fun fact. Um, so I did push another poll live uh, just a few minutes ago. So hopefully those of you uh, can see, take a look at it. So it's a quick poll. We've heard a little bit about cloud. We saw a great demo and some discussion about cloud and cloud processing and where Hadoop 3.0 is going. And cloud has kind of been a bit of a theme throughout uh, the last couple of days. So we're asking a question specifically about cloud. And there it is. Yep. Yeah. So, so look for this in the app. Just give us a quick answer if you haven't already. Um, where are you in terms of an are you, what are your plans in terms of pushing workloads to the cloud? Just started. So you're really at the beginning of that journey. Most of my workloads are already in the cloud. So you're really pretty far down that. You've adopted the cloud in a big way. Um, really not planning to for one reason or another. Um, be interesting to see how many are have no plans and not relevant for those of you who uh, maybe it's not, uh, not something that's part of your job or something that you're concerned with. So take a second and pick the one that's most uh, relevant for you. And then uh, let's see, we got, see if the network is failing. No, we got to get the results. That's great. So um, starting to get the results in. Some people are really at the beginning, and there are actually a reasonable percentage who have no plans uh, to move workloads to the cloud. So interesting. So let's go ahead and do our last bit of housekeeping. Um, just as a reminder, we've said it before, but if you haven't already, you have a couple more chances only to visit the Passport uh, participants and, and get yourself entered for the drawing. And again, it'll be announced after the show. And then just what to expect for the rest of the day today here. Here's the agenda. Community Showcase is only open to 210s. That's why I say give you a heads up that you only got a limited number of chances. We're about to go on a break, get you there a little bit early, which is great. Um, the crash courses have been extremely popular. I've heard of people standing room only line. So again, if you're interested in the crash courses, really do make sure, I want to encourage you, you get there early for those. So we've got a crash course on streaming analytics, very popular. Uh, and then, of course, we've got lunch back in the Community Showcase and another crash course on Apache Spark this afternoon. So something that, uh, you know, again, if you're interested in that. Um, some afternoon break in the concourse. And then we do have birds of a feather at the end of the day. We'll have some birds of a feather sessions as well. All the info should be in your app. So with that, I want to say thank you to everybody. I hope you enjoyed the morning. Go enjoy some of the sessions this afternoon. And we'll see you next year in San Jose. Thanks very much. Till